It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Sharon Horgan and Rob Delaney. Hi. Hi. Gotta get that right. <laughs> you just can't hear it on stage. Um, so I know that obviously we all know the story of you guys met on Twitter, you knew each other for a while, and then you put the show together. But what was the moment where you went, actually, this is a working relationship, not just someone that I'm going to be friends with and, and hang out with and, and built that level of trust with each other as well? Well, we, we knew we were never going to be friends. <laughs> Not really. Um, well, well, pretty immediately. I mean, I, I think the first couple of times we uh, wrote together, it was hard because it's always hard to begin a, a writing partnership because you feel awkward and you feel a bit shy and you're sort of worried what the other person thinks and, you know. Um, but it happened pretty quickly, actually. I mean, probably when we were at second draft of the pilot yeah. script. Maybe. We would always say, like, whenever we prefaced a story from our own lives that we thought we might be useful, we'd be like, okay, don't hate me, but I did this thing. <laughs> and, then, and then after a while, we stopped saying it because we knew we were beyond yeah. salvation. We would just say the thing. <laughs> and obviously, no warning before it happened. And obviously you ended up making Catastrophe, but were there, was there any sort of brainstorming session where you banded other ideas about before you landed on this concept? I mean, not, not too really. seriously. No. Uh, I think briefly we flirted with the idea of um, one of them being in prison, and maybe it would be a marriage that existed, you know, like through conjugal visits and stuff. But then we thought, or we could just do Don't it in a house. Don't give away our other idea. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fucking hell. But yeah, then we just decided to actually uh, write what we knew. And since I'm the only one who's been in jail, uh, the two of us, <laughs> <laughs> we, we did it once in a, in a home, a house. Yeah. What was the biggest learning curve for you, Rob, in terms of writing stand-up comedy and structuring a joke in that way to shifting to narrative form? Uh, well, y that's a good question. I, I mean, I knew how to say things that at least I thought were funny. And uh, I knew what stories I enjoyed and stuff. So I, I, I kind of was, I felt somewhat comfortable with dialogue, but uh, in terms of story structure, you know, Sharon definitely taught me a lot um, in the early um, years. Uh, so, so yeah, I, you know, I felt like I could like say any little chunk that you might have heard on screen, but then like where to put the chunk? That's where Sharon came in. <laughs> Chunk placement. I know where to put the chunks. Yeah, she does. <laughs> and how about you, Sharon? What did you learn from working with Rob, given that he had a different background to you in writing? Oh, gosh. I mean, just how to keep going until it can be as funny as it possibly can be. I mean, we're both pretty hard um, taskmasters on each other, which is, I mean, one of the, the best bits of our working relationship is we'll never sort of let ourselves just turn something in and say, that'll do. Um, and because he's, uh, I, I, because he's got this incredible natural uh, ability just to express himself in a way that I don't think anyone else in, in the world can express themselves in that way. I don't know if I, I mean, yeah, I think I learned to sort of maybe free form a little bit more or like push language a little bit more, you know, because he, he's got such a sort of creative way of saying disgusting things <laughs> <laughs> or making really brutal things sound sweet or sweet things sound disgusting. <laughs> I think I, I learned that. Did you ever have to look at some of the things that you're saying and some of the jokes that you're making and go, oh, that crosses the line? Because it, it gets incredibly dark. Like there's a joke about the Me Too hashtag in the episode that we just watched. So you're not afraid to push any boundaries. Are there ever things that you pull off the table and go, that feels like it's going a little bit too far? I don't think so. Not that I can think no. of, you know. <laughs> I mean, you think of why, like, we weren't doing, like, the Me Too um, d experience that's happening now is wonderful. So we're not saying that's funny. We're saying it would be funny if a college professor tried to tell his female students that he invented it. That's funny, <laughs> that, that weird asshole, who we all know, you know, we all know a guy <laughs> like that, and fuck him. So... You know, you can talk about anything. It's just what's the volition behind it, you know? I think when we, we first started writing the, the first season, we were nervous about stuff that we had already said and filmed and edited. And, and, but when it's about to go out on TV, we would be nervous about some of the stuff we were talking about. But that kind of, you know, dissipated a bit over the years. 
Mm. And did any of that come into the fact that obviously you're writing the show and you know the audiences in the UK and the US are watching it and there's different sensibilities of what's acceptable? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we think about it a tiny bit. <laughs> I feel like the first, uh, when the American audiences first saw the first season, which ends with a massive fight um, as Sharon's, and then Sharon's water breaks, um, American people were like, well, they can't, that's not nice. That shouldn't be how it ends. Whereas British people were like, yeah, of course, yes, that's of course, that's life, you know? And, uh, you know, American people were like, we wanted it all tied up in a bow. And it, even in the few years since the show has come out, you know, uh, I think American audiences have become more accepting um, of the, you know, the horrible things that we'll do and say. Like there doesn't always have to be a, a happy ending. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you don't always have to feel good at the end of a comedy. <laughs> Thank God. Because that's life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you think about it as well in terms of cultural references? Because there's a lot of things that are thrown in that are very specific. And do you have to sit there and go, does the joke still work if it makes a reference to something really British if you don't know what that is? We, we do a tiny bit. <laughs> uh, well, we, we do a bit, but then... Yeah, we don't go too crazy doing that. Like in the, in the first episode that you saw where Sharon's like, Pret, Pret, William Hill. People might, I mean, everybody now knows what a Pret is. You might not know what a William Hill is. It's, it's a, a gambling shop. shop. And uh, and then uh, you know, but pub, we know what that is. So we figured that'd be funny enough for American audiences, where in the UK people just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> And I know a lot of your method when you're writing is to read the lines out loud and kind of go over them in that yeah. way. Is that something that you did right from the beginning or did it develop from it the is. process? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, that was another one of the slightly embarrassing things. You know, you're not just... Uh, we, it took a while for us to fully relax in, into doing that mm -hmm. because you would write a scene together and then because we didn't know each other that well, we'd like sort of, you know, well, shake hands and go, that was a good day's work, goodbye. Yep. God, don't want to read this shit out. <laughs> but um, after a while, you, you kind of relax and you know that it's reading it out that really tells you how good or bad it is. You learn so much yeah. from that. So, yeah. And do you have a process, if you're both disagreeing on whether something works or, or it doesn't, do you have a way that you settle arguments and decide who wins? Uh, we sword fight. With yeah. uh yeah, no, we um we uh, here's the thing, if Sharon and I disagree, we know it's two people who care massively about the quality of what winds up on screen. So I never think like, oh, she has a different opinion, that must mean she's an asshole. I know it means that she really cares, you know, so I consider very carefully what she has to say before we ultimately settle on my joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but it, it is kind of different because I think sometimes in a in a writer's room you might find that you might fight for your own joke that little bit yeah. more, you know, because it kind of you know it, it sort of matters in that way. But for us, it sort of becomes such a it's just the two of us, you know. It's just like a two and we really enjoy like I love writing dialogue for Sharon. Sharon loves writing dialogue for Rob. So we absolutely write each other's characters and then we obviously all the other ones too. So we're not really too precious. We're like, did we laugh when we read it? Then we don't care who did what. I read an interview where one of you referenced something you call the asshole pass, where you make sure that each character is the right level of asshole. Oh, Could well, you talk a little it, bit it, about it that? It was, yeah, there was, we, we uh, initially, we would give me a slight sort of sweetness pass and give Rob's yes. character a bit of an asshole pass, yeah. just to make sure that it was, you know, not too sort of heavy on and one side of the other. And that was based on a game that I used to play when I went to NYU <laughs> called Pass the Asshole. Um, called, yeah, sweet, sweet, sweet <laughs> asshole. <laughs> I wanted to ask a bit about the casting process um, because obviously you're both actors and you've been through that process and you know how horrendous it yeah. can be. Yes. So was there anything that you did to try and make that a warm and welcoming environment? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I hate uh, auditions. I think I'm terrible at them. Um, you know, I, I, I sweat a lot. I lose my entire personality and all my skills. Uh, you know, I bring too many bags into the room and then spend half an hour picking things up and dropping things <laughs> on my way out. Uh, and also, I, I think one of the worst things about um, casting is, you know, when someone is distracted, you know, someone gets a sneaky phone out or gets a message or when there's no, if it's a comedy, when there's no laughter at all. So um, we would just 
try and put people at ease straight away as much as we could. We would never, you know, I, I notice here that it's very much like you go in, you do your thing, you're out. Like, I mean, people are coming in and out like five minutes. We never do that. Even, even if it's someone that maybe isn't entirely right for the part, we sort of let them have a go and then we'll let them have another go. And because it's not a nice feeling when you leave and you feel like you're beating yourself up. It, it's such a brutal industry anyway. So I think anything that kind of helps that we're delighted to do and, you know, and good stuff comes out of it. It's not like just from the goodness of our hearts. You oftentimes get a better performance or, <sighs> God, it's hard. <laughs> and obviously you, ha you know, the directing is one of the, the pieces that you do hand over to someone else, but do you still have a lot of conversations with the rest of the cast about where you see a scene going, wh where you think their character's coming from? Yeah, you know, we try to filter that through the director mostly just so people don't go crazy because if you're on a set and you have a bunch of people talking to you, it can get confusing. So, uh, but yeah, we, uh, and plus by the time the fourth season's rolled around, we already know everybody yeah. and like I'm personally, you know, as interested in what Mark Bonar's Chris wants to do as Chris as what I think he ought to do, you know, so because they're so great at it this by this point. There's always a little bit of rehearsal time as well. So there's always that sort of sense of getting to uh, have a bit of a conversation about it, you know, before. You can sort of sneakily say what you think without feeling yeah. like you're treading on anyone's toes. But invariably, the only thing we'll ever pull the director aside, we'll just say, like, could you ask him to say it, it faster? Quicker. Just do it quicker. That's a really our only note. Yeah. Because <laughs> a lot of times actors will be like, well, I have to act <laughs> the package <laughs> to the destination and just <laughs> fucking say it, man. We hired you. <laughs> we hired you because we like your face and the sound of your voice. We already like you. <laughs> it's the wrong crowd. It's the wrong crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and for both of you, do you find that you're already so familiar with every line? You've read it a hundred times out loud as well. So do you find that you really don't have to do any prep? You can just show up on set. We've no choice. We, we're like... Yeah, we give her, We have too many jobs to do any real... So, so thank goodness we've read it a thousand times. We kind of know it and so, everyone yeah. else's parts. But yeah, we are, we are kind of... We sort of forget that we have to do that bit next. Yeah, you know we're, yeah. we're like Which, oh you know, shit. It's good for me. Like I went to acting school and I was bad at acting while at acting school and for years afterwards. Um, but when you're also the writer and the executive producer, you have too much to think about, which is good for somebody like me, so that I don't like slave over every syllable. Um, you know, I'm also having a like the producer hat on as well makes me think like, okay, I see where the sun is in the sky. That means we have X minute X minutes to do this, so we have to. Move. So I'm not as precious about it, which for me results in better performances. And also, it, it's it's interesting being in the edit because. You know, you know. Sometimes we, you, you do uh, you do a scene, and and you're not you're not happy with what you've done, and so you're like just just one more go, and you know everyone's up against it, and you know yeah. you might be eaten into the next um, mm -hmm. actor's time, and how many, and and it's really interesting the edit being in there, and and sort of seeing all those takes, and knowing that there's so little in it a lot of the time. You know, a lot of it's sort of you know you're worrying about things, and you're sort of magnifying it in your in your own head. So it has sort of helped me to relax a little bit more and sort of trust what people are telling me and less about what I'm telling myself in my head. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I know that you also only had two directors the entire show. Was yeah. that a conscious decision that you wanted that repeat? That's we tried we to have do. the same director for all yeah, four series. Yeah. When we found out he couldn't do the fourth season, I, I was like, oh, I just might not do it because we loved him so much. Yeah. I was like, well, it'll probably suck. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, we get all the credit, which is unwarranted because other people work very hard on the show and do a great job. Um, so I was terrified to work with uh, Jim O'Hanlon. I mean, first of all, he's Irish. And then, <laughs> but uh, the, he was amazing. Thank he's God. So great. Yeah, he Jim, so Jim O'Hanlon just knocked it out of the park. Yeah. He was amazing. But in the UK, we don't do things in, in blocks. And so it's almost impossible to have several directors over a series. We shoot so out of sequence. Yeah. Yeah. You're shooting, uh, You're shooting the whole season at once, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and then I'm also curious, because you mentioned writer's rooms before, what the biggest differences for you, Sharon, have been between sitting in a writer's room where it's you and Rob and maybe an assistant to writer's rooms that you've been into the States and that process. What are you asking? I'm just curious about like <laughs> what the main differences are oh, for you in those oh, two experiences. Um, I mean, I really enjoyed them both, by the way. I mean, uh, when, I, when I did my, my first... What kind of answer uh, is that? <laughs> with you more, <laughs> I mean, for sure. But, 
Mm. I, I think I, 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 I just couldn't believe that there was that many people in one room all working on your idea and being that as invested in it as if it was their own show. Like I was really like taken with that and uh, you know thrilled with it. Um, but you know it, it's 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 I guess sometimes harder to be heard and and sometimes there isn't always you know a wonderful dynamic you have to get really lucky with sort of the the chemistry in 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 the room and stuff and but i mean the great thing is is that you can farm out a bunch of episodes to great writers and and then they all land on your desk and you're like brilliant uh, let's <laughs> go for lunch but we 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 tried it actually in our third season yeah. we tried it and we we got i mean honest to god two really great writers and it just didn't sound like the show. Yeah, we got the script and we were like, oh my God, this is great so for much. a different show. Yeah. We read it and we just, they couldn't, yeah. yeah. It just works for some shows and, and not for others, I think. Yeah. And when you're structuring out an episode, are you thinking about it's the character and the narrative arc first and then you're kind of figuring out where the jokes are going to land within that? Or yeah. are you ever yeah. like, oh, I've got this great idea for something that Sharon oh, would say to uh, Rob? Yeah, I mean, we'll there's a little bit of it. that. There's always a few little sort uh, of... For, uh, but for at least three series, I was like, we need. I want to walk into a spider web and like freak <laughs> out and fall down. <laughs> and, and I don't care <laughs> what happens in the rest of the episode. And we yeah. just never found... That's one <laughs> joke I want to do. So d that, the next yeah. thing I do is just going to be me walking into various there spider webs. <laughs> and be like, oh! <laughs> uh, there is jail. definitely, definitely comedy writers out there who would structure an entire episode around you uh, walking into a spider's web. 100%. And, 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 and that's just their method. And we tried to get in one... Uh, many times we tried to do a thing where we're like walk, getting out of the tube and see an ad that has like a sexy model oh, woman yeah. and I, where I'm going to be like, oh God, I wish you were that beautiful. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we tried to get that in and yeah. it never did. So those... But yeah. now you've seen them. <laughs> And is it important to you to have a lot of the just kind of very banal elements of life, like when it's like, oh, Sharon never opens the mail and just these little things to pepper those throughout each episode? Yeah, I, I love all of that. I mean, that's some yeah, of my details, favorite stuff. Yeah, are, are key. Yeah, just, you know, him eating a second breakfast that, you know, he would have hidden from me <laughs> if I if I hadn't just slipped out or, you know, just just the nonsense kind of stuff that you, you talk about when you know someone that well. I love all that. I love it. And I know that you guys are tyrants about your actors not improving, um, but Carrie Fisher was your exception. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, do you remember any of the scenes that came about that actually weren't in the script that ended up in any episodes from her just riffing on set? Well, they, they weren't scenes. She would just, you know, go for it with the dialogue and add in her, her own stuff. She invented... We had a scene with her where she's babysitting for us and she's watching TV and she improvised the show that Whole she was watching for the show it was called my children are schizophrenic and then she goes and through it <laughs> she was just she waltzed through the back of a scene singing a song about a, a areoli yeah. which you know that's like you know you say hey a nipple but really the nipple's just the tippy thing with the thing around it that's the areola uh just for you sir and so <laughs> the, it, she sang a whole song about Ariola, yeah. and that was amazing. And we kept it. It's in yeah. the show. Yeah. Did you have to start structuring in extra time when you knew she was going to be on set? Yep. Oh, my God, yep. 100%. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also love the decision that you made to develop the supporting characters a little bit more after the first season. What was the reason for that decision? I mean, mechanically, the reason was is we finished <laughs> shooting it and we realized that there was only one scene in the whole first series that neither of us were in. Yeah. And we were like, yeah, we'll need more of those. Yeah. Um, so that's the only real reason is laziness. We really, we Not really that they're brilliant or anything. <laughs> I mean, there's a little bit of that. But um, we did really enjoy that one scene. Yeah, it was we so loved great. watching. Yeah, so I mean, see, I mean, like w watching Chris and Fran together, you want to see that, you know? And yeah. so it's just, w so once we got to... When we wrote the first season, we didn't know who we were writing for. When we wrote subsequent re seasons, we did. And so, you know, you want to see Ashley Jensen on screen as much as you can. And also, after the first season, the response from people about the supporting characters was really great. So we knew we were onto a way oh, with yeah. them and, and that people wanted to see more of them. 
I'm also interested because you mentioned the characters Chris and Fran, it feels a little bit like watching their relationship is kind of what Sharon and Rob would go through if they decided not to be together. Was mm -hmm. that yeah. something that you played into? Yes. And not just them, but uh, Fergal and his wife and um, Dave and his wife. We really tried to sort of um, show, you know, alternate reality, sort of like there, but for the grace of God, go we. Uh, is what we're doing with all the couples. And it, it, it really helped um, our relationship on screen as well, sort of looking at other relationships and seeing what we didn't want, you know. Like I know my real life wife and I will come home from a date, a double date with another, and we'll be like, "Fucking good thing we're not doing what they're doing." Or alternately, we're they're, we're not as good as them. They're a better pair of people. We should aspire to that. <laughs> And at what point did you move to England in the process, Rob? Um, I, uh, w when the show got picked up. Yeah. So I flew over for three and a half weeks, I remember, uh, to do the pilot. And uh, then, I, uh, then when it got picked up, I knew we had to move there. So, I, so my wife graciously um, and our two kids agreed to move over for what would, we figured would be about six months until they canceled the show. And uh, now it's been five years, and uh, we're not leaving even though the show is over. <laughs> so, I mean, literally, we're still, I just finished all the customs stuff to have a bunch of our, to have our, like, things shipped over five years later. Because I was like, guess we're here. Did it help to be writing a character who's assimilating to culture over there at the same time that you were going through it? Were there any nuggets that came through from your own experiences because of that? Well, you recall earlier I call them chunks. <laughs> um, no, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, it did. But, like, what were they? I can't remember. But I'm sure there were at least 11. I also want to ask about the fact that your characters seem to do better in their relationship when they see other people having a terrible time. So was there so, some sort of game that was like, how oh, yeah. terrible can the people around have their relationships in order to lift us up? Sorry, what was the beginning? I was laughing at 11. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's really just about the fact that Sharon and Rob seem to do a lot better when they see other people doing terribly. Was that, again, something that you thought, like, that would bond them because they come together by bitching about these other Oh, couples? yeah, and sure. I think there's plenty of, of that in the series. But, you know, and it, even if it's just a body language thing, you know, like sitting across uh, from a dinner, sitting across from Chris and Fran at a dinner table and the sort of like looks we would be able to share with each other about how shit their relationship looked was uh, <laughs> was a handy thing to have. Yeah, I, like I, I, with my kids, if I'm at a park and I hear one of my kids start to cry, that's worse than hearing a kid start to cry who isn't mine that's like near one of my kids. Like I'd rather have my kid get hit with a rock than be the rock hurler, you know? So does that make sense, what I'm saying? <laughs> I get I get a high when I see other kids misbehave that aren't my own. I just immediately am like, oh, thank God, it's yeah, not mine, it you know? You. Yeah, yeah. So it's don't throw relaxing. rocks at my children, obviously, <laughs> but, you know, I'd rather, anyway... <laughs> Going to playgrounds is going to be a yeah. bit rough for you now. Um, and then with the kids who played Marin and Frankie, I love the decision that they're not actually really part of the dialogue at any point. Um, did you ever consider like, oh, Frankie would be able to talk now, so maybe we should include him a little bit more in the script, or was that never a question for you? No, that was never, <laughs> that was never a question. I think, but well, I mean, the show was never supposed to be about that, really. I mean, there were obviously um, characters who have kids, but it was never supposed to be about their parenting. It was about how, um, you know, a, a couple survive whilst also being parents. But also, we, like you were saying the other day, we kind of know what our skills are, and uh, our skills are not writing dialogue for child actors. Um, or dealing with child actors, or dealing with the parents of, of child actors, Th or the agents, or the chaperones uh -huh. of uh, child actors. That said, uh, <laughs> we did. Frankie did get a couple lines. Oh, he nailed them. And he was so nailed amazing it. this year, so, yeah. so good did for him. Did you feel the same about animals since you killed the dog off very quickly? Uh -huh, people were so mad about know. that. Um, we, yeah, that, that animal was a pain in the hole. And, yeah. And, the, the animal handler was even worse. The worst person. So if we hadn't have written in the script that the dog got uh, died, we would have killed it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, I'm also curious for you, Sharon, because you also worked on a show called Motherland that you created after you'd already got Catastrophe up and running, which is also about parenting to some degree uh -huh. and how terrible and horrendous and hard it can be some days. No kids talking that one either, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were there any things that you kind of took to that show that you'd originally thought of for Catastrophe but just didn't quite fit story-wise? Oh, um, 
I don't know. I mean, they're they're tonally kind of different, even though it's the same landscape. I guess it's definitely not about relationships. It's it's more it's more it's more akin to a workplace comedy. It's just that the workplace is outside the school <laughs> gates. Uh, so it's much more about um, friendships and the friendships that you make or have to make just because you all happen to give birth around about the same time. So, um, so yeah, no, I mean, I bet there's stuff that I wish I had for the show, like the storyline in season two where I try and make friends with a mum who I think is cool and who has literally no interest in me. I mean, that would have been a great one for Motherland, but it's gone. We used it. I also love the fact that down to the last episode, there's a lot of long game jokes where you make references to things that happened several episodes ago. Um, like one of the episodes has Sharon London sex show up on Rob's phone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is that something where you kind of sit there and go like, oh, we should definitely make sure to include this again. You're holding yeah. on to it for that we moment. Do. Or rather the phone rings, you know, and we're as we're writing it and then we're like, oh, we should still say the yeah. thing that it's yeah. it, you know? Because what, what kind of <laughs> terrible husband would be like, it's time to change that. I'm going to change it to fucking Sharon, boring asshole, you know? <laughs> that'd be terrible. That would be like the death knell. So you gotta keep it Sharon London sex. But there's other fun little ones. Like we have a recurring character of um, my friend from Ireland, uh, Kate. <laughs> and every season we have her say, I'm not happy. Uh, for, you know, she just works it in. Or we, we work it in. I don't think in. she says it in the fourth though, does she? Oh shit, maybe she doesn't. But the other three. Yeah, three's on. good. Or, or, or like the way Fergal talks about um, Spain when he moves to Spain, he hates Spain. He always brings ham up. Always um, ham. There's <laughs> just too much ham. Yeah. So we always get. There's no ham at my party. Oh, yeah. you haven't seen that yet. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you're gonna love it. <laughs> did you do anything differently in your approach to going into the final season and knowing? You know, did you start at the end instead of the beginning? And oh well, we had the end it? before we sort of started but yeah, we did know more clearly what we wanted the ending to be of the fourth season more than any of the others because frequently what would happen is we'd outline the series and then we'd find as we by the time we got to six it would be quite different from what we had initially envisaged but with this one it pretty much stayed we knew where we wanted to go because we knew how we wanted to end yeah so i i guess yeah i mean maybe it was a little different in that we had to bear that in mind and you know work towards it in a certain uh, to a certain extent but what we definitely didn't want it to feel like was like a final season. We wanted it to just feel like catastrophe, you know, and be mm -hmm. as funny as it possibly could be and, you know, yeah. not dwell on that. And was it important to you to end the show while it was still on a high? Because that's very British. Yeah, it is. Oh, it big is time. Bit, yeah, you know, because we we were thinking that, like, we couldn't be prouder of Catastrophe in the four seasons that we made, but we could be less proud if we'd fucked up our batting average and made a bad fifth season. And with this one, we kind of realized, like, we've said what we have to say, and we didn't want to be greedy and, and make a crap one, because uh, that would disappoint you. You know, we don't want to <laughs> do that. Um. And I'm trying to figure out if there's a way for you to answer this question without really giving away spoilers. But I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about figuring out how you were going to remember or pay tribute to Carrie Fisher and kind of still have her character present in the final season. Um, well, we it, it's one of the things that we spent most time thinking about, you know, when we were plotting out the final season, um, because, you know, it was a very difficult situation in that she's Carrie Fisher, so the whole world knew that she, she was no longer with us. So uh, that is a difficult thing to, to work in, the death of a character when you know that the beloved actress who played her is gone. Um, so, but what we definitely knew that we wanted to do was not like brush over it, you know, not deal with it in a phone call. We wanted to use it as a as a way of like you were saying playing um paying tribute to her in, in the best possible way so we really hope that we've done that um she's her her episode is our final episode but as um, you can see with the first three episodes we just pretended that she wasn't dead and that felt nice yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah it's nice because she's yeah. present throughout the whole season yeah. still yeah. um so we have a couple of audience questions i wanted to start with one from lauren who was asking both of you about your writing process and if your real life ever becomes too personal to put in the show or fa you have family members asking you specifically not to put something that happened into it. Oh, we definitely, um, although Sharon and I, like many 
people in the public eye or whatever have, uh, have assassinated our own privacy, uh, we wouldn't do that for to our families because they're nice civilian people. And so, yeah, my God, yeah. I mean, my like real intimate stuff is f fully off limits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, feelings aren't off limits. We want to, yeah, I mean, I'm going to put things that I have really felt in real life, but real facts, you know, probably less so. Yes. Um, and I have one from Kevin who is asking, did you start from a place of let's torture our audience with cliffhangers every season or did that sort of evolve over time? We just love a cliffhanger. It's fun. <laughs> I mean, why not end with a question mark rather than an exclamation point, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, because then you're involved more. Because if we're like, <gasps> you know, and then it stays with you. and uh, there, there has to be. I mean, there is so much good TV out there. There's a lot of very good TV. And there has to be something about your show that makes people want to come back and watch more. So finding out what that thing is. Um, I mean, and honest to God, we would do a cliffhanger and have no idea how to figure it oh, out. None. So we'd be like, don't, why did we do that? Um, and then I'm know. sure at least one of our renewals happened because like w some executive was like, I mean, I kind of want to see what happens. <laughs> so I should, uh, we were gonna, oh, we were gonna, but I don't know, I kind of want to, my wife likes it, so if I <laughs> guess I'll give it another season. <laughs> Um, this question's a bit random, but I quite like it. It's from Matt, and it's about advice for yourselves, but instead of looking back a long time, what advice would you give yourself one week ago? <laughs> find, find out the precise location of the toilet at the gym that you're not a member of that you're visiting before you get in there on Tuesday because you're going to fucking wish you had. I don't know. Don't go out on the lash two days before you get on a plane and do relentless uh, press tour because you're going to be really tired like I am now. <laughs> I think that's much more valuable advice than five year ago advice. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you both a couple of questions about the beginning of your careers when you were starting out professionally and Rob, you were doing stand up and I know Sharon, I was reading that you used to put plays on above a pub in Camden. What was that first moment where you started to go, I feel like I'm, I'm able to transition and really do this professionally rather this is something that I feel like I would love to do professionally but as a bit more of a spare time thing? Um, well, um, I mean, I didn't feel that for, for years. I mean, I sort of, I, I mean, I 100% gave up um, because putting plays on above pubs is nice, <laughs> but not when it's all you're doing for, you know, year after year after year. And, uh, you know, and you sort of lose your confidence a bit because you put those plays on so you can invite agents along and, you know, the people who you think might see you and help. Um, but it never really happens because people don't want to go to some shitty pub <laughs> in Camden on a, on a Tuesday night. So um, I, I definitely stopped and, and gave up. And it was really just through writing that I got back into it again. And I don't know, when did I know that I might be able to make a living? Um, I think considering I'm quite a pessimistic person, it was m the first proper paid TV job that I got. And it was quite a, a nice one, and I was like bamboozled as to why I had it because I already thought I'd missed the boat. But yeah, it was getting my my first sort of proper paid TV job. How about for you? Yeah, Ryan? my story is really quite similar. I mean, I went to NYU to to the musical theater program and thought I would do musicals. Then my my senior year, I saw the Upright Citizens Brigade. This would be back in 1998. And uh, I saw Amy Poehler and Tina Fey and the rest of the Upright Citizens Brigade, and I was like, "Oh, oh, that's what I want to do." Like, if like musical theater for me was like smoking a joint, that was like a f speed ball, and I was like, "I need that." And so, uh, but then you know, for me, uh, life uh, derailed me for a while um, in the form of alcoholism, and uh, I uh, you can laugh at that, and. Um, <laughs> And then I had to get a job that had benefits so that I could get health insurance because this was before Obamacare. And so I was like, yeah, I think I, this is what I do now uh, is like work at a shitty um, uh, internet company that got delisted from NASDAQ because it was installing spyware on people's computer. I mean, the <laughs> worst. And I'm just there to get health insurance. And uh, 
But then, uh, then I got laid off. Uh, the third company that I got laid off from, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do stand-up literally all the time. And I'm taking the bus to do stand-up. Um, and my amazing wife is getting me health insurance through her job as a teacher. And she's the breadwinner. And, and I'm like, I'll see you later. I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to fly to Minneapolis. I'm going to pay $600 for a plane ticket to go to Minneapolis to do stand-up and make $900, but I'll spend the, more than the difference on food while I'm there. And so, I mean, it was just a nightmare. And then I started to try to get hired as a late night writer. And uh, then finally in 2010, I got a job writing for a show on MTV. And that was the first time I was ever able to truly pay the bills. Um, and, and then thank good God almighty, it has worked out since then. Um, now... <laughs> Oh, but like if we're here at SAG AFTRA, I would say uh, if like acting is great and wonderful, I love to do it very, very much. But if you're in more of a power position if you're if you're writing and producing literally anything. And don't feel bad if the first thing you do sucks because it fucking will. And then you keep going and you get better and better. But it's better to try to give yourself a job because nobody gives a shit about you. So you have to give a shit about you and show people I'm worth giving a shit about by doing that yourself. And then people will just sort of start to follow your lead. That, that's completely true. I mean, after that first job that I got that I left my waitressing job uh, for, I was completely unemployed for a very long time until I started giving myself jobs. No, yeah, that's great advice. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Um, you know, since since we are at the end of catastrophe, I just wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about reminiscing and what what's been the most challenging part about playing Sharon and Rob on the show for you both? Playing them. Yeah. I, I think it well for for me it it was um, just being able to switch off um, you know producer brain and writer brain and try and be in the moment and concentrate on what I was doing I mean there's this when we were doing the edit of <laughs> of this final season there's um, a scene uh, where a, a really amazing actress is doing her thing and I'm in the background and we only noticed just before we were locking the episode I'm mouthing along to her words <laughs> in the background yeah. of the shot Wow. Uh, so, like, that is a challenge sometimes to stop, you know, thinking about what everyone else is doing. Everyone's very good at their jobs. You know, just chill the fuck out and, like, be in the moment with what you're doing and try and do it as best you can. I would say for me as an actor, it would be uh, realizing that uh, an audience is very very smart and very and they want to have they tune in to enjoy the show so they're already they're like buying into what you're doing so you can be really silly and do the silliest thing with the silliest voice like a little kid in one scene and then in the next one be doing deadly serious you know bellowing anger and sort of the whole scope of human emotion you're you're allowed to do that i think when we first started out i'd be like i should be quite serious and delivered the bizabadum and the hum and we're adults. And then I re I realized, no, even a show that deals with stuff as weighty as this, you can go Captain Bananas and then be like deadly serious and an audience will totally go for the ride. So yeah, I mean like as actors I would say like never be afraid to do the fucking wackiest, most insane, explosive thing, you know, because they can dial it back, but you know, so have definitely have fun. And what part of each of your characters are you going to miss the most about them? Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, the I, dueling, sparring scenes with Sharon. That's yeah. what I'll miss. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, it, you know, what you can do when you're writing a character is make them as articulate as you would like to be in real life. So, oh, yeah. you know, I'm, I miss that. I really miss that. Don't you wish? I mean, even just earlier today, I was doing a press thing, and I, I like had a little bit out of body experience, and like imagined watching myself, and I was like, "That's so boring. He should definitely <laughs> sew his mouth shut, or have it sewn shut." And I was like, "If only someone could have written something funnier for him." Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Congratulations on an thank amazing you. last season. The last season drops on guys. Amazon this Friday, March fifteenth.